Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Does it yep. work in? Okay, good. Uh, well, I really want to you know, say thanks for coming out, and I want to especially say thanks to Thomas because he's done a great job of putting this together. And, you know? Okay. What can I do about that? Now? Is it working? I don't have one of those voices that carries. So. Okay, good. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, Chris. Now it's too loud, right? Dang it. <laughs> uh, talking about Christian fundamentalist families. And whenever I talk about quiverful and uh, uh, spiritual abuse, it's kind of a disturbing, upsetting topic. I always try to be kind of lighthearted about it and tell some jokes or whatever, but because um, I don't want to bum everybody out. These are supposed to be fun, these conventions. So, uh, but I do want to start out by giving everybody a heads up that it is, I am talking about spiritual abuse and so if there's somebody here that that's real personal, I wouldn't judge you if you didn't want to put yourself through a presentation on this topic. I'm also planning to leave time uh, at the end for Q&A. So if there's anything that I'm mentioning that you would like more clarification or want me to talk about more, just keep that in mind. So for those of you who aren't already familiar with the term quiverful, I'll give you a quick introduction. Basically, quiverful is just another word for Christian fundamentalism. And I always say, you know, fundamentalism, quiverful, it's like not that much of the fun, but plenty of the mental. And, and I'm not saying that in a facetious way, but like it really is just this very powerful head trip. It's more of a paradigm um, in which the, it's like a way of looking at the world, a way of processing and filtering everything through this lens of biblical literalism. And so I like to describe Quiverful as you know, more of a, a vision, this all-encompassing vision of this big, happy, godly family. And it's something that is so pervasive, it affects the mind and it affects every aspect of a believer's life. And the longer you're in it, the deeper you get. So while I say it's mostly about perception, filtering the world and every life experience through biblical literalism, um, quiverful believers do adhere to a certain specific beliefs about family and relationships. Uh, starting with the pro-life idea, that truly godly families will trust the Lord with their family planning. And children are viewed as an unmitigated blessing from God, so couples are willing to have as many children as the Lord chooses. And all methods of contraception control are considered a lack of trust in God. At the heart of Quiverful is patriarchy, the uh, ideal of biblical headship and submission. And this is the belief that by God's perfect design, the father is to be the leader in the home. He serves as the provider, the protector, uh, the shepherd for his wife and children, and he is primarily responsible for his wife and his children's spiritual well-being. So, and with that authority or responsibility comes the commensurate authority over all the members of his household. So once a family accepts the two quiverful biggies, prolific motherhood and patriarchy, uh, there are a number of other beliefs or uh, ideas that kind of follow afterwards, um, such as homeschooling and sheltering the children. There's an emphasis on modesty and purity and um, courtship instead of dating. And I'm going to talk more about all of those. But submission and baby making are always like the central focus in quiverful families. And there's a huge emphasis on hierarchy and authority in the minds of fundamentalist believers. Like honor, obedience, submission, these are all like highly valued qualities because it's only when the whole family is in right relationship with God and with each other that then they're able to be assured of the Lord's protection against the world and the flesh and the devil. So it's this emphasis on patriarchy which guarantees that the, to the degree 
in which a family puts these quiverful ideals into practice, that family is living a dysfunctional relationship dynamic, which necessarily involves uh, mental, emotional, and spiritual abuse. And too often there is going to be physical and sexual abuse as well. Okay, my computer's being weird on me. Uh, before I get into the specifics regarding abuse in Christian fundamentalist families, I'd like you to take a moment and think about who it is you know um, who might be quiverful, because it's, it's more common than you would think. Um, who do you know that has a family that looks like this? Not, it doesn't necessarily have to be this gigantic. It's the, the idea. Jim Bob and uh, Michelle Duggar of the recently canceled Way Too Many Kids and Counting, uh, <laughs> they are classic quiverful. And while the atheist community rightfully looks on the Duggar family as a three ring circus with plenty of bozos and clowns, um, I want to say that I'm not really here to bring the freak show. I never want to talk about spiritual abuse and Christian fundamentalism simply to make a spectacle of the crazy, quiverful believers. And the reason that I continually talk about this stuff is because I want to make a tangible difference in the lives of the actual women and children who are being abused in these homes. So whenever I talk about quiverful, the worldview and the lifestyle, and I get into the specifics of it, people come up to me and they say, you know, I think that's what my niece is doing. Um, I was talking to a Fox News reporter a while back, and there was this case where a family, you know, they had 10 children, the wife was, she gave birth at home, and the baby died, and it was a classic, you know, quiverful family. And so I'm doing this interview, and afterwards, the reporter goes, can I just ask you a few questions? Because I think you just explained my sister to me. You know, she says, she's been, um, homeschooling and she's just kind of cut herself off from everyone. She's not watching television anymore. She won't be involved in anyone except for, you know, her little circle of believers. And she just gets weirder all the time. And so um, this is something that happens because you, when you say quiverful, it sounds like some kind of weird anomaly, some kind of weird little group that you're going to find over, you know, off homesteading or whatever, but there's actually, there are a lot of people right in the quiver, uh, in general society. So unlike fundamentalist Mormons who tend to congregate in just a few places like Arizona, Utah, Texas, whatever, you'll find quiverful families in just about any denomination and in every, every uh, town. And this is because Quiverful is not actually a, de a denomination with a creed to sign and a church to join. And it's not technically a cult in the strict sense of having like a one central leader. But instead, like I said, it's more of a mindset. It's more of this really powerful head trip in which each family becomes a cult unto itself. So be thinking about who you know. Uh, there's a website called the National Center for Family Integrated Churches in which family integrated is code words for quiverful. And I refer to this a lot because um, it's, you know, just kind of this registry. And I did a, a search on there for within 10 miles of St. Louis. And I came up with 50 churches and individual families who subscribe to quiverful ideals. And only a small portion of the Quiverful community even knows this registry exists. So this is like a, a very small representation of the Christian fundamentalism around here. So I mentioned earlier that biblical, mar that, uh, biblical marriages which follow the patriarchal model with the husband as the head and the wife as the submissive helper are necessarily dysfunctional and abusive. And that's because you can't have a healthy, mutually beneficial rela uh, relationship which is based on hierarchy and a substantial power indifference. So um, the rigidity, the restrictiveness of the, the strict gender roles, these are going to result in basically you end up with narcissistic assholes for husbands 
and manipulative martyrs for wives. So last year, I did a presentation at the American Atheist Convention uh, in which I used the domestic violence power and control wheel, which is a, a tool that counselors use to help victims of abuse recognize the ways that they are being manipulated, exploited, mistreated, and enslaved. And in my presentation, I showed that Christian family values provide chapter and verse justification for every single element that is used by these therapists to be able to say here, you know, this is not right. This is what's going on in your relationship. So just look at this graphic and, you know, just very quickly I'm going to go through. And I kind of like if, um, you know, I know it's a, a big audience, but it, it, I, it's, I think it's so easy to recognize these things. So when I... When I mention this and I talk about what we're talking about, if you think of a Bible verse or a Christian cliche that goes along with what I'm talking about, you can just shout it out if you want. It's kind of, a, kind of an easy and fun thing to do, actually. <laughs> so starting with emotional abuse, this is put-downs, um, name-calling, attacking a person's sense of self-worth. I mean, can you think of anything in the Bible that would make you feel lowly and unworthy? Maybe starting with original sin. <laughs> yes. Um, the, there's a verse, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You know, there's just so many things. Without Christ, I am nothing. And, and so this is just super easy to do. Intimidation, using fear to control a person any connection there between the whole Christian paradigm, you know, hell to begin with. I mean, the whole spiritual, um, you know, you don't want to be like, you know, the salt loses its saltiness. How can it be made salty again? There's just all of these, these uh, teachings that make you feel like you've got to really stay on top of things or, you know, you're just going to be open to Satan. You're going to be open to you know, your own deceptive heart or whatever. And so there's a lot of intimidation going on. And what about isolation? <laughs> like, do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. There's this whole us versus them, saved versus unsaved. It's just kind of prolific throughout the whole ideal. It's a, you know, anybody, anyone who's not willing to leave their father and mother, their children to follow after me is not worthy of me. So there's really this sense of isolation of, you know, you, don't, you have to keep yourself spotless from the world, come out from the unclean thing, and all of this kind of thing. So that is definitely a part of what's building up to this big old head trip. Uh, minimizing, denying, and blaming. I mean, when you think about it, in light of eternity, and this is the perspective that Christians has, whatever you might suffer, whatever hardships you might be going through, you know, if you can put that into an eternal perspective and say, yeah, but in the end, there's going to be this great reward. There's going to be heaven, and all of that is just so glorious that, yeah, yeah things might suck right now, but it really kind of minimizes your personal pain and makes you feel like, well... I mean, at least nobody nailed me to a cross, <laughs> whatever. And so, so there's a lot of that. There's a, the whole idea that, you know, God, it says his anger is but for a moment, um, but his favor is for a lifetime. And so it's always this idea that, you know, whatever you're going through, you know, kind of like suck it up and maybe even praise God for it because in the end, you know, it's all going to be worth it. Um, using children... I used to, whenever you, I think of Jesus and you see the pictures of him surrounded by the little kids and, you know, the verse, let all the children come unto me and um, Jesus loves the little children. But it, when you think about it, and especially from the quiverful perspective where they're saying that like arrows in the hands of a mighty man, so are the children of one's youth. I mean, that's the ammunition for a holy war. That's what they're equating children to. And... Uh, so that definitely plays in there. Male privilege. <laughs> I mean, where do you even start with that one? 
it's, it's all about, you know, it says that um, man was not created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. I mean, just the fact that he's the heavenly father and you're always referring to God as he and him, it kind of makes it, um, it, it makes it just perme permeate the whole, the whole concept of, of Christianity and uh, spirituality. Economic abuse. I mean, never mind about the tithe right off the top. You have to give 10% of your income. But is, did anybody hear Pat, Pat Robertson recently? He was counseling this elderly couple. They're like, you know, we just don't have that much money. We really want to be able to give to your ministry. And he's like, well, you know, look around your house. What do you have that you could sell on eBay? <laughs> he counseled another couple, elderly couple. He says, well, you can take out a reverse mortgage and, and you know, give to the ministry. So there is definitely this whole system. And I'm going to talk a little more about economic abuse later on. Uh, coercion and threats. I mean, that's the same thing. You know, what could be more intimidating than worship me or burn in hell for eternity? So, like I said, it's just really easy to go through and see where, you know, these ideas. And, of course, it's not presented so blatantly, which is what makes it more insidious. Because, you know, when you're sitting in church and you're hearing this inspiring sermon, and all of these elements are in there, but they're couched in language, that makes it sound inspiring, makes it sound motivating. It makes you want to, you know, believe that there's something bigger, there's something higher. And so you, you, uh, you start getting into these head games with yourself. It's kind of a mental thing. Um, so, yeah, when you're talking about spiritual abuse, which means that you have to add in all of the God stuff, the God factor, try and figure out, what God wants, what his will is, what his purpose might be. It makes it a whole lot more complicated and a lot harder to recognize. So when In Touch magazine broke the story about Josh Duggar um, molesting five young girls when he was a teenager, exactly no one at No Longer Quivering was surprised. Um, and we also weren't surprised to hear about the way that Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar handled the situation. And that's because denying, rationalizing, minimizing, spiritualizing, and covering up abuse is what these families do. From the outside, they, they look very whimsical, very wholesome, you know, big happy family. But as I'm going to go through and, and demonstrate here, that's not what's the, the whole picture. Oh. So as soon as the Duggar family uh, molestation scandal broke, I was contacted by like, a slew of reporters and journalists, and nearly all of them asked me the same question. And their question was, how common do you think it is for some kind of abuse to be occurring in these households? And does anyone want to take a... No. I mean, I'm going to go with this one and just say all of them, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, and I'm not, and I don't say they're all messed up in the in the same way that you know all families are messed up, and so not like that. Um, here's another thing. I, I'm just going to talk about the risk factors. I'm going to go back to this uh, list of quiverful ideals, and I'm just going to give a little more detail and show you ways in which these beliefs are like a setup, or what I like to call fertile ground for abuse and dysfunction. So we're going to do this quickly, because I want to leave time for Q&A at the end. So starting with the biblical model for godly families, uh, Christian fundamentalists frame dysfunction, abuse, psychopathology, all in terms of sin, uh, repentance, forgiveness, grace, and demons. So uh, they believe that the best answers for every problem can be found in the Bible. And do you see where that can just kind of be a setup to complicate and make abusive situations uh, 
much, much more risk for abuse in that kind of situation. The, so the husband is the head of the household. So right away, you have patriarchy, you have hierarchy, inequality, um, strict gender roles. And, and so basically, the men answer only to God, which as atheists, we know that, that what that really literally translates to is that they are only accountable to their own imagination. And so, I mean, that's, that's a, a, you know, there's, well, I'm going to go into that. Hold on just a second. Uh, wives must submit to their husbands. I'm going to give you a minute to take that in. The Bible says that wives are to submit to their husbands in everything which is kind of a, an invitation for them to become martyrs, to develop that martyr mentality. It's also an invitation for the men to control and to dominate. No birth control. I mean, not even natural family planning. So it's easy to recognize where owning too many pets can be harmful. But what about child hoarding? <laughs> Um, I mean, can you imagine the risk factors? Because there's no way that you can keep up, especially if you're the one doing, you know, giving birth, going through the pregnancies, and you're already worn out and tired. But how are you going to give individual attention? How are you going to keep on top of the things that are going on and things that need attention in that family? Uh, the next three, stay-at-home moms, homeschooling, and sheltering children from the worldly knowledge, they kind of all go together to create this insular and isolated environment. And, you know, I want to say that the, the actual practices, I mean, homeschooling, there are people who homeschool that aren't abusive. There are people who have, you know, loads of kids who aren't abusive. So I'm not, you know, I'm not saying stay-at-home moms, that's a problem. It's not a problem. I'm talking about the headset. Uh, head trip and the, the ideals of what's going on in here that makes, like, exasperates and makes these a real problem. So, um, you know, when you have so much isolation, the family has no outside resources. The kids, they, they don't have any contact with anybody who could, you know, maybe check on them and say, you know, is that okay? They don't get any kind of proper education. So they don't know what's normal. They don't know what is abuse. They don't have, you know, somebody that they can go to and just talk to. So what about the Christian fundamentalist insistence that children be instantly, joyously obedient? And this is something that, I mean, you watch the Duggars, they'll go on Good Morning America or, um, you know, the Today Show, and they've got this, all of these kids, and they don't even fidget. They just sit there and smile, and everybody's like, wow, you know, what good, respectful, obedient children. But let me tell you how Michelle makes that happen. Starting in, when her children are just becoming a little mobile, about six months, she does what is called blanket training, where you put a little blanket out on the floor, and you set baby there, and you say, stay. And of course the baby is going to, you know, move around. The minute that the baby, you know, puts a hand off or a foot off, she, she whacks it. And she does that repeatedly, daily, for a period of time until the baby learns you stay on this blanket. And so she can take that baby anywhere, put out the blanket, put the baby down. She doesn't need a playpen. She doesn't need a babysitter. That baby's going to stay. Can you imagine being trained like that from infancy? What happens later when you want to try and like think for yourself or question authority or you know take a bold move or whatever? But that has been, you know, I mean, literally beaten into them from a very young age. So that is a setup for sure. Uh, the emphasis on modesty and sexual purity. Uh, you know, we hear about this in the atheist community a lot, um, about body shaming, about the purity culture. We talk about consent. There is none of that within the mindset of quiverful families. It's all this emphasis on, um, you know, on the girls. 
that it's on them to uh, basically protect themselves from these guys who can't help themselves, who will, you know, they will do something to you if you expose, you know, a bare shoulder. Sorry about that. <laughs> and so, and it also teaches the girls that their value lies solely in their virginity. So, I mean, I've probably said enough, but I do want to mention that not every quiverful family gets their own reality TV program to help pay for all of these kids that they're having. So uh, the Christian right's emphasis on self-sufficiency, it means that quiverful families most of the time don't apply for any kind of government assistance. So you see these huge families and people assume, well, they must be getting food stamps, Medicaid, they don't. Most of the time, they don't apply for it because they consider that not trusting God. They consider that socialist programs, and they don't want anything to do with it. And so they are not doing well financially. Um, and when you add in the fact that there's only one income, you have way too many kids, um, and you're homeschooling them all, it just kind of adds up to financial destitution and all of the added risk factors that are inherent to poverty. So this is why I don't hesitate to say that if you know of a quiverful family, um, it's extremely likely that this family is going to be seriously dysfunctional and abuse is almost always taking place. And I'm not saying that everyone is being molested or everyone is being beaten, um, but there is no way that people who are living according to the biblical model for marriage and family are not being fundamentally abused. So abusive situations are complicated enough. But when a Christian family is also required to figure out God's will and his purpose for all of it, the result is this overwhelming entanglement of spiritual discernment and faith and trust and uh, eternal rewards and judgments and divine intervention. There's, you know, angels and demons and all of this spiritual mindedness that just thoroughly complicates and convolutes and just like radically reorients the perspective of literally every um, practical consideration. And so when Josh Duggar uh, confessed to his parents that he had been touching these girls, um, how do they as Christ followers respond? The first thing that they're going to do as fundamentalist Christian parents is to blame themselves and to say, okay, what did we do? What kind of sin? You know, what's wrong with our relationship with God? Because if you're in a if you're in a right relationship with God, you're supposed to have that spiritual protection. So they're thinking, in order for this kind of, you know, demonic activity to come into our home, we must have done something wrong. Um, secondly, they're going to blame the girls, which is messed up, I know, but they're, I'm, I can imagine them thinking, well, you know, maybe, were they running around in their nightgowns in front of Josh, or maybe they were taking a bath and they didn't have the door shut. I mean, that's just automatically the kind of thinking. And, and then they would blame the devil. You know, they're saying, okay, this is an attack of Satan. He's trying to ruin the testimony of our family. And so this is um, another thing that they do. But it just kind of goes on and on like this. And the family is just so overwhelmed. And they're kind of paralyzed by indecision because um, they don't really have the tools to adequately, adequately address the situation. So they can't even say whether or not Josh's behavior is actually abusive. So uh, what do they do? <laughs> and again, keep in mind that the Duggars are convinced that God has established this hierarchy of authority or jurisdictions, as they call them, in which the order goes God, um, family, and of course within the family, the father is the head authority and then the church elders, and then the church, you know. And so, biblically, biblically speaking, there's really no point in which the outside world, um, the unbelieving world, is considered to be a legitimate interest in this situation. So they're going to pray for Josh. That was one thing that they did. They start focusing on his character, on his relationship with Jesus. And, 
uh, but this, it's still happening. And so what do they do next? They go to the church elders. And that was the next step that they took. And interestingly, like they home church. So you know that they went to a, a whole nother bunch of quiverful believers. And these elders in the church, it didn't occur to them to contact the authorities because they're still looking at it as a spiritual issue. And even, you know, after that, you know, they had some counseling and stuff. And, and, and Josh came again and he said, you know, it's still happening. I need help with this. And so then they went, you know, they're still keeping it in, in the church. They went to a state trooper who was in that church, you know, a family friend. And he gave him a stern talking to. And um, never filed a report. Um, but, and, and still, that didn't solve the situation. And so then they sent him off to a family friend who like, put him to work building houses and getting some counseling. They're like, they're still thinking this is a character issue. They can just distract him, maybe. You know, just, just let him work. He's got too much energy. They're t thoroughly unequipped to deal with a situation like this. But CPS or law enforcement, um, in the interview that they did with Megan Kelly, Jim Bob said, we felt like the last jurisdiction of whom to make things right was the law. I mean, they just, they are completely ill-equipped for any of this. So what about the girls? Um, they are told that it wasn't that bad, that Josh was just curious, uh, he didn't mean to harm them. And then they're given this whole story in which young boys can't help themselves. And it's up to the girls to avail themselves of the protection, uh, such as being under proper authority or using the protection of purity, the protection of modest clothing, the protection of being in right relationship with God. And never mind that the girls were doing all this. I mean, they didn't do anything wrong, but this is what they're being told. And so they're internalizing this and they're saying, you know, um, it was us. So according to the eternally happy ending narrative that the Duggars are telling themselves, the girls are not victims and they're not even survivors of spiritual abuse. Um, but instead, they are cast in with the highly favored Old Testament Joseph, whose brothers sold him into slavery. And you know, it turns out a happy ending. So then they say, well, what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. So suffering in this life is insignificant, and it's even trifling um, compared to the faith strengthening and the soul saving purpose of trials, which will be richly rewarded in the eternal life in heaven. So again, with the minimizing. So, I mean, how can we help? Because when you, when you understand the situation, when you understand how this whole dynamic really sets a family up, not only to have the problems, but when the problems come, they have no way of really dealing with it. And I asked you at the beginning to be thinking about who you might know. Um, because these relationships, they're complicated. And you know, just getting out, leaving that faith, just because you, you get, walk away from the religion doesn't mean that all of a sudden everything is magically fine. So, and it is a heavy topic, and you guys are all looking really sober, <laughs> and I apologize for that. Um, and as much as I'd like to now put up a three-point plan and say, here's how you can help, you know, these are actual people, and these are, are complicated situations. So I'm just going to open it up for Q&A, and we can talk about it. It's not like I don't have any answers. I have some really good suggestions for how you can help people that are in these uh, situations, but it always kind of boils down to the personal. OK. Vicki, what would happen to uh, a wife if um, she started to disagree with the, the husband, uh, and then particularly in public, um, if the husband was speaking? Like I saw the two of them on television, the Dugers, and she just looked at him with adoring eyes, and mm -hmm. uh, he did most of the talking. But uh, what would happen if, uh, if a wife started to disagree with her husband? Well, 
you know, biblically, that husband needs to bring her back into line. And he will do that by quoting Bible verses, by making her pray with him, um, etc. And, and if that doesn't do it, then he, he will go to the church elders. And they're pretty good about getting that woman back into line. Also, the other women in the movement. You know, it's amazing how much pressure there is within the women. You know, I remember uh, in home church, one of my good friends who was married to this, like, David Koresh kind of crazy, like, he was so horrible. He made me feel grateful for my husband. And, um, and I remember, you know, she was so miserable, and I was like, I don't know how to help her. I prayed with her, we talked, and, and so then I went and found this book by Debbie Pearl called Created to Be His Help Me in which it's all about this, you know, if you submit to your husband, if you just are a better wife, if you just do a better job for God and for your husband, for your family, you know, then God's going to work in his heart and make it all, and it's a very manipulative kind of thing because, you know, they'll tell you you can't change your husband, but by submitting to God, then God will change. It's like this really twisted, manipulative, and it, the, it becomes so complicated, you know, because you feel like you're submitting, but there's a lot of power in that submission. There's a lot of control there. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I mean, unless she just really has a, a, a strong backbone and just says enough, she'll probably be brought back in and, and made to submit. I, I've heard a lot of, um, qui you know, former quiverful families who come to no longer quivering and the wives say, you know, he would restrict my grocery budget or, I mean, the lifestyle's already so restrictive. You kind of can't take anything more away from it. But, and there's like the really bizarre stuff. There is a Christian discipline site in which they, you know, they basically say you just need to spank her and not in a, you know, kinky sort of way, but in a discipline, you're going you're gonna to submit to me. So, yeah, it's not a good situation. Hi, Ms. Vicki. I have a friend who's been emotionally, verbally, and sexually abused, and she is seeking a divorce. And, but her I'm church... sorry, I can't hear you down here. Sorry. I have a friend who's been emotionally, verbally, and sexually abused, and she's seeking a divorce but her church has convinced her kids that if she sought a divorce, she would go to hell. Um, mm -hmm. And so now she has to choose between uh, losing her kids or staying in an abusive relationship. And uh, she has no interest in actually leave, leaving a religion, but everyone in her church has already shunned her unless mm -hmm. she goes back into that abusive relationship. What kind of advice could I give her? It, it's not uncommon. Uh to have your kids used against you to, to try and you know, keep you in line. And what I found with the women who have come to the, the support group is a lot of times you just have to take that step um, and get out yourself. Because if you, if you remain in that situation, it's really hard while you're in it to get a good enough perspective to be able to to even understand what's going on, let alone rectify the situation. And so I, I have had a number of women who, you know, they just get out and they, they get away, they get a chance to just kind of recuperate and, and get their head on straight, and then they can go back and help their kids. And, and also it's not that uncommon that they do lose their children, which is a really um, crazy, crazy thing. But you know, if, they, if, she, if she can get out, she can get some therapy, she can get some support, then, you know, when, when the kids are growing up, she's there as an influence to be able to, you know, eventually they're going to come and say, what happened, Mom? Because, I mean, they're not enjoying it either. And uh, so eventually, I, I think the first step is, you know, get out. And uh, so... Um, I, so my question is about who, who kind of leads 
uh, the family into the quiver full movement, whether it, like it's obviously it seems like there are a lot of advantages for a certain personality of husband, but is it ever the wife leading into it? And also who in your, in the people that you've talked to who leads out and how many couples make it out together and re mm -hmm. Reform. Surprisingly, uh, there's a, a good amount of families that come out together that the husband <coughs> is ready to get rid of it too because he's also not happy. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting. Most of the time, like a, a big percentage of the time, it's the women who get their families into this. And, and the reason is, is because they already have a sucky marriage. I mean, people with healthy, you know, mutual, um, egalitarian relationships that's working, when they're presented with the ideas, ideas of patriarchy, they'll go to church and they'll hear, hear, you know, the husband is to be the head, the wife is to be, and they're like, yeah, 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 that's in the Bible. And then they go about doing their mutual partnership. Um, and they just, it, does, it doesn't stick with them. But when you're in the situation where it's not working and you've got this guy who's like not really pulling his weight and he's kind of controlling and, and micromanaging and this kind of stuff. And, and so you're trying to find a way, you know, what's the key? What, what is God, how can God fix this? And you come across patriarchy and you're like, ah, let's try this. And a lot of times it's the woman who brings all of these ideas in and, and kind of introduces it. It's, a, it's a, a bad trap to get into. Hi. <laughs> Uh, hey, thank Rebecca. You. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question actually piggybacks a little bit off of that. Um, uh, there are uh, a lot of couples that I know who still suffer, whether they've come from Quiverful or not, um, from this patriarchy. Um, and sometimes they will notice it together. Um, and as you said, you know some couples who have gotten out. Uh, what would you say would be the root if, if a couple has decided wow, our dynamic is really messed up and we want to fix this, um, what would you say is a, a route that you've seen taken for people to come out of that, not just from Quiverful, but just from um, um, a relationship that has the dynamic of having the patriarchal, mm -hmm. strong man, submissive woman, and they want to get out of that? I think, you know, because over time, these couples become more and more isolated and they end up only knowing people who think just like them, they're, they're in a home church by this time. Um, I think one big step that has been very helpful in these families is just to get out of that church. You know, just go to a, a more liberal church or even, you know, just a plain old non-denominational whatever. Not that it doesn't happen there, but the more people, the more input of other people and you can start seeing, okay, this isn't normal. Okay, you know, these people don't have this, you know, conflict and contest of, of power <coughs> at all times. And so, I mean, that's a good thing. And also, no longer quivering is pretty darn awesome for uh, helping people to just start seeing it and thinking it through. And it's kind of interesting because no longer quivering is not an atheist website at all. And we don't want it to be because the people we're trying to reach, you know, they would not go to an atheist website. but. Because this is so pervasive, because it's like all encompassing is more of a mind trip than anything, um, they come and they start reading these stories and they start thinking, you know, this isn't really working for me either. And in interesting, I mean, you would think that the people who are just so wholehearted, they're so dedicated and they're, you know, have put everything, they've invested so much into this lifestyle, you would think that they would be like the last person to be able to reach, but like a huge percentage of the people who come to No Longer Quivering and stay there, they end up as atheists. It doesn't take them very long to go, you know, this is all bullshit. And, <laughs> and they dump it. So it's, uh, it's good. Hi, thanks for the speech. I uh, was curious about how dominant the specific Quiverful movement is in the religious landscape. In other words, uh, outside of Christianity and this movement, is there, is there a, a bigger or a similar sized issue within uh, Judaism uh, or any other religion? Uh, I wouldn't even know how to answer that. Uh, you know, Quiverful is not 
like some anomaly of Christianity. Everything that's taught in the pulpit in your mainstream evangelicals, that's all it is. It's biblical family values. It's just these families actually put it into practice. And so what I've been seeing, you know, especially with the advent of the internet, there's, you know, more access to information. I think, like, just average everyday run-of-the-mill Christianity is becoming so indefensible. You know, it's so easy to just tear that apart and, you, you know, chapter and verse and people are like, oh, yeah, that is kind of contradictory and weird. And so what's happening, I think, is, you know, there's this fashion that just kind of just goes, let's find a kinder, gentler Jesus, and they're going more progressive. But then there's these others who just, like, dig in. And they're like, no, you know, we are not being taken over by the liberals and the humanists and everything. And so then, you know, it's kind of like there's this fracturing and there's much more of a, of a division. And, and I think that that's what's making the fundamentalist group, you know, that, that's really growing, especially here in America, just because people are terrified of, you know, atheists. <laughs> and so... Is rhetoric? Pardon me? I, I think that really is, yeah. All right, one more. How have your children been doing since you stopped quivering? I don't know the range of ages, but do you think the uh -huh. older ones have seen and learned enough through your experience to not start quivering in the first place? Uh, I wish that was true. I mean, my, the, the kids, they, uh, we practiced such an oppressive form of Christianity, they were really happy to just be done with it. And, and the thing about it is just now they had the opportunity to just interact with reality without that filter, and they're really liking that. They're liking not having to conform to this prepackaged chapter and verse, here's what God wants for your life. And so they're kind of going in every little direction, which is fun to watch them kind of invent what they're going to do. So I have, like, real kids now, and I, li I like them more you know, better than when I had like the whole Duggar, everybody smile and, yeah. They're, they're kind of more of a hassle though. <laughs> you know, don't tell them I said you that. You don't have any special Sky Daddy to keep them in their head. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Vicki Garrison. <laughs> An awesome lady.